Tonight, you're in for a treat. We have two poets here tonight with us, and after they read, they'll answer questions and sign books. Our first artist is Liz Whiteacre. Liz Whiteacre teaches creative writing at Ball State University. She is the author of Hit the Ground from Finishing Line Press and co-editor of the new anthology, New This Week, premiered this Monday. Um, Monday Coffee and Other Stories of Mothering Children with Special Needs. Her poems have appeared in Word Gathering, Disability Studies Quarterly, The Healing Muse, and other magazines. You can visit her website at whiteacrehitstheground.wordpress.com. Liz is an extraordinary artist, teacher, and colleague. Her work is wise, sly, and poignant. According to re reviewer Linda Cronin, Liz Whiteacre has created a collection of poetry well worth reading and hearing. <laughs> the words reach out to each and every one of us. Everyone has experienced pain at some point, and although it may not be constant or chronic, it is a situation that everyone can understand. We are pleased to have her here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Whiteacre. Good evening. It is such a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm going to read some stories, poems, this evening um, that chronicle my experiences with spinal injury. Um, earlier today, Ida Hagman asked me some questions about the book. And one of them was, why poetry? Why did you choose to tell your story through poems? My accident took place in 2000, and a lot of time passed before I started writing frequently about it. And I started to kind of come to my experiences in little vignettes or little moments, little bits. And I found myself kind of zooming in on something that seemed significant, writing about it until I realized it was significant, and then creating a poem from that moment. So I'm going to start with a poem called Cold in a Paper Gown, my first visit to the ER. I eavesdrop in the emergency room, next door past thin plaster, an orderly assures a stranger who cannot see out of her left eye that her doctor will soon arrive. Soon is measured by the number of emergencies. I wait on x-rays. I cannot feel my feet. The pain in my hips and backs mimic childbirth contractions imagined each time the PA plays lullabies. They let me keep my underwear. The cotton comforts the pain when I stand or sit or lie down. My spinal fluid weeps and the doctors whisper over my emergency. In the hall, a nurse examines the woman with a good right eye. Excuse me? The doorway stands the blinded woman. She is barefoot in a fire engine red Miss Button power suit. You're going to be all right, aren't you? Sure, I'll be okay. I pray I don't lie. She straightens her suit, me too. An orderly coaxes her by elbow back to her gurney. I still shake when a nurse comes with a wheelchair and news he's contacted me a ride home. When we pass her room, the woman speaks on her phone. I'm waiting for the doctor. Yes, soon. No, I don't know what's wrong with me yet. I spent a lot of time in waiting rooms. <laughs> So much so that um, people I was sharing my work with while I was writing started saying things like, maybe you can't have too many poems about waiting <laughs> rooms. <laughs> right? may, may, can you change the furniture? <laughs> like, can, you, can you do something for us to make it different? And that's when I realized that waiting rooms were really significant to me at that time in my life. And then I had to figure out a way to kind of condense and zone in and figure out exactly what was important about them 
and then focus in on those stories. So there are a lot of abandoned waiting rooms poems. Um, <laughs> fortunately for all of you, I'm not going to read them tonight. But that was a big change. Um, when my accident happened, I was almost 23. It was right before my birthday in the summer. I was a lifeguard. I was teaching kids how to swim. I was teaching sailing instruction at the university where I was at. And I was healthy and I was strong. And in a moment, my life changed. And not only did I change physically, but emotionally too. I didn't know what my future held. And the people around me started viewing me in a lot of different ways. Um, and so I found myself coming back to those moments as well. So I'd like to share a few poems of how people viewed me or how I thought they viewed me differently. This one's called Two Feet Shorter Than My Usual Height. Embarrassed, she says, I didn't know if it was you in that wheelchair. She's talking about last Saturday when Dad drove me to the mall to cheer me up. He persuaded until he wheeled me so I wouldn't tire, strain, hurt. There was a long crutch to the bank of wheelchairs, then slow maneuvering into stores. My first time, odder than showering under the eye of the middle school gym teacher. And was that your boyfriend? She adds, passes me chips, avoids my eyes. I was in an accident. My dad came down to take me to test so I wouldn't be alone. I crunch and notice the chips are stale. She doesn't even offer the salsa. We'd rolled by a trendy store. Dad saw Hawaiian shirts on sale, wanted to check them out. He only left for a moment to see how a bright shirt fit his tall frame in the mirror. He didn't know it would be hard to find me, tucked between racks of obnoxious flowers and surfboards. I didn't panic when he called my name twice. I didn't feel lost, folded in the fabric two feet shorter than my usual height. Panic didn't burn my throat until she stared wide-eyed at me through the window. When Dad pushed me, two bags held tightly on my lap. She turned quickly, no smile, no hello, and now stale chips, lame party. I wonder what tokens will follow. Wonder if I will ever again turn on heel, leave assholes in wake. It's for my own good. I lie fetal on the table, and you squeeze my hand, stroke my temple. Your job today is soothing me. I can't believe I've agreed to this. I didn't want to seem ungrateful or that I wasn't trying to get better or that I didn't care. So I said, okay, now I'm letting this doctor stick long needles in me. Seriously, like they were this big. That's not in the poem, but. <laughs> I'm pinned in this thin paper gown tense and you a stranger stroke my hair as my mother's done, while this doctor pushes each thick needle into my hip and back, and his assistant, who smells of spearmint, pushes and pokes my skin as each slides in to help find just the right spot. Each needle burrows a tender tunnel. I'm a cheese grater now filled with so many ragged holes stuffed with saline, Tracks throb when the metal's removed. The doctor does it again and again. The Venus flytrap extract this doctor said would numb the pain doesn't help at all. But you, a nurse who looks like my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Goulding, gaze at me and whisper how brave I am and how much you know it hurts and how after it's over, it will be better. It's for my own good. And I find myself really soothed by you. I will survive these slow invasions, the therapist needing of liquid that ought not exist, the workouts and the shots to follow and follow. Your voice hypnotizes. I finally believe 
this bulky saline solution designed to tear tissues binding muscles together will dissolve as we rebuild myself. <coughs> Retirees pity me during water aerobics. <laughs> yes, I had several jobs over the summer between in, in, in graduate schools when my accident happened and so I had been a full-time student and didn't get a teaching position. They made sure I got one the next year. And then <laughs> I was working for quite a different, like the community center and the Girl Scout camp and the, the Jewish camp and oh, the, the university, a bunch of different places. I was bopping around and doing all sorts of different aquatic things. And one of them was teaching retirees at the community center every Tuesday, Thursday morning. <laughs> Water aerobics, of all things. I was their fearless leader. <laughs> These decaying bodies, barely covered by black lycra, have bobbed and bent and flexed for over a year with me, as I've instructed them in the community pool on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. They've complained affectionately if the blue water is less than 78 degrees and call me sweetheart. Take it easy on us, they would teased if I ordered one more set. Chores or Kevin's visit the coming weekend were on my mind when I shouted ski or curl or push, churning chlorinated water. Now I have still bills to pay, chores to do Kevin's coming visit, but I obsess if my brace looks stupid stuffed beneath my new turquoise tankini suit. It's vanity, really, working to hide it from these men and women, some taking similar bursitis, arthritis, and pain medications. But it's ugly, like the perm I begged my mom for in seventh grade. <laughs> the two-week home trial stuck, and months of hiding the frizz and ponytails until it grew out followed. I check and recheck to make sure the straps haven't flopped out, drag on my butt, invite stairs. I instruct from a cold folding chair on the pool deck, goosebumped and on display, unable to hide behind well-coiffed hair, well-manicured clothes. My arms and legs feebly gesture moves these water aerobic veterans know by heart. Gossip and chatter is absent today, but for calls of, how you doing, honey? I'm no longer invincible youth. No age before beauty jokes when the ladies shuffled with me out of the locker room. I was the girl on the Clarial commercial, shiny curls swishing, confidence showing in my perky routines. I used to bounce effortlessly in the water while they struggled to keep up, their bodies protesting. And now, propped by ugly brace, I watch from the sidelines as an eager pubescent watches kids dance in the gym from the bleachers. I call scissor, egg beater, sweep, and their buoyant bodies respond, beautifully churn water. So there was a big transition period, and I think I might still be in it, <laughs> where I had, I had to learn newly what my body could do and what it couldn't do. Right? My mind had a big list of everything I could do, and my body was out of sync, out of tune with that. My body would protest in painful ways sometimes. <laughs> um, and so it takes planning in a village <laughs> to raise children, to help people through illness, through, through accident, those sorts of things. And it, it took me a little while to figure out. And this is kind of a poem about coming to that realization that you have to ask for help and you have to plan ahead when you need it. Yeah, trash fairies just don't appear. I tried summoning them. This is called Trash Can Unmoved. At dawn, I wake alone with a start, crutch quietly with precision, like my first drive alone in the escort, the carpet foreboding as rush hour traffic, the furniture fierce as intersections, the tile sneaky as ice. 
stepping so gingerly, my brace, sleep sweaty, does not move. My aluminum crutches lift up and up. We labor toward the kitchen. It takes 20 minutes, these 20 odd paces. All the bags shoved into the ugly can reek of decomposed chicken carcass, sanitary napkins, and other rank foodstuffs that cannot wait until the next collection. The can's belly is less than the width of the door, but how to move it? I can't heave it up anymore and march to the curb. It thuds when tapped at its base by a crutch's toe. It won't budge and pain shoots down my back, down my leg. I live alone in an alley in a shitty apartment. Two hours until pickup, two hours to get this can to the curb. Kicking with foot, shoving with knee, sliding with chair and crutch, I curse and cry and pop Vicodin and eat a granola bar. Frustration floods my pores, the sweet sweat I remember from childhood when mom flipped flashcards for mathematics, sitting parallel to me on the hard dining room chairs. The trash can finally looms on the threshold's lip, ready to stumble down the stairs. I duct tape the lid so it won't spill in flight. Crutch cocked like shotgun, it leaps toward the ugly can, launches it with furious chutzpah down the steps, and there the plastic can lay unbroken at the bottom. Muscle spasm seized my back. Spent and beaten, I'm a young woman who witnesses what random accident can do to flesh and bone, who is patched together with medications, elastic, Velcro, metal, wires, hope, who's incapable of domestic chores so simple is taking out the trash. Later that morning, this young woman crutches 40 minutes from her handicapped spot in the closest parking lot to work thinking of the trash can lying lifeless on its smooth, unscuffed belly on the cracked sidewalk, like the dead kitten she'd found after school by the curb in front of her home. She feels her sweaty, chafed armpits moan, wipes them with paper towel after taking 30 minutes to pee. Then she smiles at coworkers, says, I'm fine, thanks for asking. So when I was developing a lot of the material for the book, I came across this prompt. I know many of you are familiar with prompts, and if you're not, make a prompt your friend. You can steal this one tonight when you get home. And it was to take an abstract concept and personify it right? so that you could work with and talk to and, and deal with that idea right, in, the, in, a, in a more concrete, meaningful way. And so, being obsessed with all things accident-related, I chose pain. <laughs> and I thought about my relationship with pain and how, in a way, it's kind of like having a third wheel. Right? I had my boyfriend, I had pain, who was always there, chaperoning us, looking over our shoulders, whis whispering in my ear. Um, so I developed a series that I'd like to end on tonight that kind of thinks about the, the relationship with pain in, in, in kind of a larger scale. Meeting at the bar, the pickup, right? the, the wooing of courtship, the you know, breakup, and then um, pain showed up in the delivery room. And so I kind of skipped a little bit there, but I'll come back and fill that in later. This is called Pain Flirts. Pain comes on strong. A sweaty hand on your thigh, back, arm, raising goosebumps. A little nausea because you know you'll have to be an asshole now. All night dodging hairy advances, clumsy innuendos, unmarked pills, watery drinks. Aggressive, this pain wants you but bad. Zeroes in and suddenly swindled, you flee to bathroom solitude. But pain knows no boundaries, follows you into the stall lumbers to your car, trails you home, hovers outside your window, bellows, you look wonderful tonight. Its shadow on the blinds dancing a polka, 
keeps you waking until dawn. Pain arrives on your stoop with the paper and a bag of donuts, offers to make coffee while you put up your feet, hums when it pre presents Vicodin and OJ on a tray. Pain courts. Pain seduces you slowly until one morning you wake to find its toothbrush in your bathroom, its underwear in your laundry basket, its non-fat vanilla soy milk in your fridge. Saturday morning, pain sips coffee with you on the sofa, laughs over New Yorker cartoons. Soon, you take pain home to meet your family. It sits between you and grandma at the long table, leaves with you at dusk, and complains bitterly the drive home of the many miles, the bread pudding, the early Monday to come. Inseparable, pain helps prepare taxes, pick paint for kitchen walls, trim toenails. Each night before bed, it hums between the sheets. Pain is needy, doesn't like when you're unconscious, wakes you the moment you dream of something else. Pain <coughs> desserts, not the good kind with chocolate. When you and pain finally grow apart, everyone's relieved. You pack pain stuff in boxes, and when pain doesn't stop Sunday as promised, you carry them to the attic. When you next poke around looking for your old blue bowling ball, you see pain's boxes stacked and dusty, and you think, pain might need this stuff. You should really phone. Instead, you lug your 10-pound ball down the attic's ladder. When you search for your old golf clubs, see the dusty cardboard taking up your space, you decide pain doesn't need this stuff anymore. So you bend at the knees, lift pain's heavy boxes. It feels good hefting them one at a time to the curb. Boxes gone, you take time after you've showered to erase pain and pain's friends, even the doctors who were clever at cocktail parties, from your address book. You don't care what Melanie says, you're happy if you never see pain again. My wedding wasn't painful, and so, like I said, there's a gap <laughs> in time there. Um, but this last one is new. It's not in the collection. Um, it was published this fall in Work Gathering Magazine, which is a great magazine to check out if you're at all interested in disability studies. It's called wordgathering.com, um, and they have just outstanding work by poets, fiction writers, nonfiction writers, um, really interesting stuff. They have tips for teaching if you're interested in teaching in your classroom. This is called Pain Pushes. Pain holds my other hand, and before I close my eyes, I see Kevin through the oxygen mask that he gentles to my cheeks. His hand cradles my knee in air, the doctor's latex palm presses my inner thigh when she guides the needle holding local anesthetic. A nurse sues my forearm, ready to sprint for the next thing needed. Still, pain stays steady, knows after all these years to whisper, don't push. I hear contractions rock me. Pain pricks my spine to punctuate the doctor's warning, helping like Kevin, like the nurse, like the doctor cutting me. I forget the husha husha he he. Pain elbows my ribs, makes my breath pop. Breathe, don't push. We negotiate, pain and I, like we might over the remote, or who's running back to the store for eggs, whether the garden can go another week without weeding. No, like we might over the best path to Texas, where we'll take her this Christmas soon. Pain teaches me patience that my body can unfold, muscles bloom, nerves pulse neon in these moments when I ask it not to push and it doesn't, and when I ask it to push and it brings forth new life. Thank you so much for your time tonight.
Thank you, Liz. We're going to have time for questions at the end. Um, but um, I'd like to introduce our next artist, our next writer. Uh, Rachel McKibbins is a New York Foundation for the Arts Poetry Fellow and author of two full-length books of poetry, which are also for sale in the back of the room. Into the Dark and an Emptying Field and Pink Elephant. For four years, McKibbins taught poetry through the Healing Arts Program at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan and continues to teach poetry and creative writing and give lectures across the country as an advocate for mental illness, gender equality, and victims of violence and domestic abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rachel McKibbins. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Liz, you were great. Well, Liz spoke of pain. I will speak of grief. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, I'll read, I'll read uh, briefly from Pink Elephant and from Into the Dark and Emptying Field, since these are the books that are on sale. Uh, but I, I kind of want to really read uh, into the newer work. I have a third manuscript that was just picked up. It was a runner-up in a contest, and they said, if it doesn't win, we still want to print it. So that's exciting. It's a chapbook called Mammoth. Um, comes out in February. Uh, this, this book is a memoir in verse. I grew up in an extremely abusive household, and um, a lot of the poetry is about that. But one of the poems that uh, I like to kind of bust out every once in a while is what I consider a happier poem, which only means that maybe a few people die in it. <laughs> I realize there are many dead people in this poem. <clears throat> Uh, oh, oh, you know what, I should, uh, there's a, uh, oh, who cares, never mind. A Sunday cross-examination of my future next husband. In my father's house, beneath the floorboards where the wood is worn, lies a jar with a faded label. Inside is a tiny daughter pickled in rose water, her wrists held together by twine. She sings a school of copper fish. They move through the tangled pipes above her rotting head. I hear them when I bleed. If you are to love me, you must believe every word of this. Every haunted girl you knew before me has been a warning, and in the mouth of each girl a brick with my window's name on it. I've watched a soul dance like smoke from a mouth and burn through my hair. I ate a plate of fingernails on my wedding day, made vows as the bones of friends stirred the mud beneath my gown. In four years, my husband's hands grew twice the size of his body, so I cut them down like men from a tree and hid them in a box. They ghost the hallways of a sixth floor apartment in Brooklyn. My children are all five of my hearts, unleashed. When I die, will you bring me flowers and a box of chocolates? Will my going skin be your saddest song? Do you understand? Instead of becoming a woman you grow old with, I want to be the God you run to. Uh, I'm going to read, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I have a trilogy in this book. Uh, that I named the Escape Trilogy. Uh, it's the first time, the second time, and the last time. Uh, I'm going to read you the last time. Uh, but the first one uh, speaks of when my brother and I tried to run away. We were very young. <laughs> uh, we ran away barefoot and uh, with a uh, pillowcase full of coins. And the second time it was... Uh, my pseudo stepmother and I that tried to leave the house. This is called The Last Time. The last time I did it alone without leaving, the welt on my face still hot. I crept, up, I crept upstairs, pried open the toolbox and grabbed the hammer, 
with his initials burned deep into the handle. My brother slept in his room, a glass box of reptiles watching over him. I turned the knob slowly, stood over my father's body, his chest heaving, then sinking, when his tongue rattled, then stopped, and the whites of his eyes rolled over, and he stared only at the weapon in my hand. And I looked at him, and I said, if you ever touch us again, I will kill you. And then he saw me. Okay, he said. Okay. Uh, the second book uh, is what I consider more truthful. Uh, and by that it means there's a far more fantastical elements woven throughout to hide uh, people's identities because everyone I know sucks. Uh, <laughs> I keyed. Uh, I'm gonna read you guys a pantoum. There was one summer, well, like every other summer, um, there's always seems, there always seems to be a rash of uh, uh, deaths uh, happening to, to girls. And uh, there was one in particular where it was on the news, it was about one a day for a good eight days. And uh, I nearly lost my mind, being um, a severely empathetic person, or as my beautiful son has called me, an empath. Uh, I have this uncanny ability to literally absorb trauma in a very not healthy way. And uh, so writing, of course, is one of my uh, most important outlets. Poem for Three Dead Girls of Last Summer. My sweetheart says I can no longer watch the news. You worry too much. And he is right. My fear is a drilling. It is constant and blood thick. That girl in the suitcase, that wife in the river, that woman in the elevator needed me. I worry too much. It is my right. My fear is a drilling, a songless bird perched upon my shoulder. That wife in the river, that woman in the elevator needed me, but I have three girls of my own. They are mine, mine, mine. And the songless bird perched upon my shoulder watches over them, my sweet little Gretels who follow me home. These three girls who are mine, mine, mine gobble up my heart like a hunk of bread. When men see them, my dear little Gretels, they follow me home. When there is a knock at the door, I stash my darlings in a cupboard. They've come to gobble up my girls like hunks of bread. Men line up like ants to take them away, to carry them home. When there is a knock at my door, I hide my darlings inside a cupboard like bowls of sugar. When they sleep, I wrap them in kite strings, line them up like ants, so no one can take them and carry them home. They clutch their dolls, and all night long they wish for boys like bowls of sugar. As they sleep, I hold them like kite strings, constant, blood thick. That girl in the suitcase clutched her doll, and all night long wished she'd been a boy. My sweetheart says, I can no longer watch the news. I'm going to clo uh, close out this book with something fucked up or messed up. <laughs> hmm. So many choices. <clears throat> we didn't know how to open the book. We, I knew what poem I wanted to open the book, but it couldn't be the first thing that you that the reader saw in the book. And I thought, well, how about this? Instead of a poem, I'm going to create um, a scene and uh, it kind of depicts a talk show. And that'll give you an example as to what's in store for you uh, for the next uh, 75 pages. So there, there's no title. It's just a block of text. A young woman from Afghanistan is the special guest on an American talk show. 
She tells her story through an interpreter, how she ran away from her husband's abusive family and hid in a field for two days before she was captured and returned. Shamed by this blatant lack of devotion, her in-laws hacked off her ears and nose. When the talk show host asks to see this emptiness, the young woman unravels her headscarf. The studio audience gasps at the soft ditches tucked beneath her hair, the quiet, bell-shaped hole hanging above her mouth. The talk show host announces she has a surprise for the young woman, then beckons for a serving cart to be wheeled on stage. Waiting on a silver platter are a pair of polished ears and a cute button of a nose carved from only the finest oak. The young woman weeps in astonished joy. Then a raffle is held and a lucky audience member comes racing down the aisle, waving his winning ticket. The man is awarded a hammer and a bucket of nails. As he pounds her new nose into place, the man can't resist nailing the young woman's eyes shut too. He's always been a superstitious fellow. No peeking his dear mother used to warn as she slid his gifts beneath the Christmas tree. No peeking, she'd growl as she crawled beneath his little bed. Thank you for the laughs. Uh, here we go. Moving right on to the, to the real grief. Um, <laughs> woohoo, here we go. Where is that stupid poem? Not stupid, where is that brilliant poem? So um, my, my niece was conceived in Portsmouth, Ohio, which seems like an ordinary thing that happens. It's how we are all created, we are conceived. Uh, the, the issue with the... Uh, Spe specifics of where she was conceived uh, is that uh, um, pediatric cancers in that area in particular, uh, it's very concentrated and it's an old mining town and the water is very polluted. It's also the oxy content, uh, cotton capital of the world, of the world. And uh, it is just, uh, it's a clearly forgotten town. I do believe that uh, the government wants just everyone to die off so that they could just bulldoze everything and build a bunch of, you know, big important money-making uh, companies and, and buildings. So uh, it was, sh uh, my sister-in-law Biz found out that uh, uh, Ingrid had the cancer in utero. When she was born, she had an extra piece of her inner, this little tiny piece of her ear. And the kidney and the ear is developed at the same time in utero, which is why they're similar shape. And um, so they saw that excess cell growth, and so they, you know, they looked, but they didn't find anything. And so when she did end up swelling on her side and her, her mom took her in, it was too late by that time. Um, I'm just going to go through these. <coughs> count. I lost a lot of blood the morning I became a mother. The mirror spoke of a 17-year-old girl who'd become the amnesia of color. I was so pale I could walk through walls. And what an astonishing language, that of a mothering body. The once kind heart gone wicked and feral. Did I tell you as I nursed my son that first hour, I felt my bones begin to thicken, spinning themselves into a coven of axe handles. But wait, it gets worse. She was changing her diaper and noticed a hard lump on her side. She took the baby to a clinic, but they didn't know what it was. They referred her to a specialist in Columbus for a biopsy. 
They said it might be. She said. I don't know what I'll do if. I can't deal with any more of. But I've been sober for. I don't even know if my car will make it all the way to. I did everything I was. Why can't I ever. Six months to a year. The water in the sink will not drain. I mean your body of its poison. The pump pumps, yet the fluid returns. It wants to be there to clog and waste your lungs. The rotting dishes have risen to just below the cupboard. I reach into the garbage disposal. The scalpel circles the tumor. Well-educated surgical steel, radiant and holy. Then a starched voice, scraps of peeled carrots, eyes of a potato, pale macaroni, anemonied cells clumped around a kidney. The water darkens with your baby hair. I roll up my sleeves, feel both of your hands, but only the hands, nothing else, or everything else. What's done is done. Greetings from the house of defeat. Close to the end, we were told to push the button every eight minutes. We're handed pamphlets on how to accept the death of our loved one. After her organs shut down, the nurse shook her head. No more liquids. Desperate rules for the dying. But tell me you could have resisted when she sat up for the first time in three days, gray lids painted in a morphine fog and pleaded only for water. Water. What person wouldn't abide, wouldn't burn down the tarnished face of God if they could? Small talk. The checkout clerk asks how my day is going. Terrible. He smiles, automatic. Then he hears me. Oh, that's too bad. Sorry to hear it. I take my bag, glancing back at the counter. Did I forget someone? Did I pay for this? I don't even want this. At the traffic light, car horns blare like skinned animals. I put my foot on the gas and go. Not because the light is green, but because we put a warm sweater on the child and then we buried her. Well-wishers have named this a difficult time. They keep apologizing for how difficult it is. If there's anything I can do, do you need anything? How about a little goddamn honesty? How about calling it what it really is? How about stop your fucking smiling? How about breaking it down? Carrying three bags of groceries on each arm and holding a sleeping three-year-old while trying to unlock your front door is difficult. Watching a coffin go by small enough to be carried by a single person is difficult. What I need somebody to do is talk about the too many dolls and the baby shampoo and the unscuffed shoes and the boxes of latex gloves and the empty car seat and the woman who survived decades of shit to end up here, an addict four years sober, praising morphine in her child's final hours. What you have to do is call picking out your baby's headstone, the ravenous hell it truly is, and say, I'm sorry. So very sorry. I'm so very sorry for this impossible time. <coughs> I didn't know how to end this book. I didn't like the, uh, even though it had been chosen to be published, it didn't seem right to close it the way I did. 
So I wrote this poem. Sometimes you have to trust when you write something in two minutes that that's what it, that's it. It's done. Drifter. I've never read this out loud. You loved me before I knew you. Back when I was only a shadow. A dark existence lit by sonogram. You exhaled at the sight of my skull, a thundering nest of tiny pulses. Though I did not know you, I loved your temperature, how it coaxed my brain to brightness, a blood pilgrim orbiting your hospice. I was already dying, but I did not seek new territory preferred your womb's tightening hold above the wretched neons of birth, above the cruel air hurling down my inexperienced lungs. What would I have done differently? If I had reached my second birthday, would I have wished to be less temporary or to have never been born at all? Dear, dear mother, I promise you, Better to have been lunar and half seen, to have occupied the space within you, a brief galaxy I will always remember. I, your elliptical daughter, traveling endlessly, endlessly. I'm gonna close out with <sighs> love, how's that? Not that that wasn't love. This is, uh, I keep Maybelline waterproof mascara in business, bitches. <laughs> I really do. Uh, no one shake my hand. I've been wiping my snot on my pants for the last <laughs> three points. <laughs> to my daughters, I need to say, Go with the one who loves you biblically. The one whose love lifts its head to you despite its broken neck, whose body bursts 16 arms electric to carry you gentle, the way old grief is gentle. Love the love that is messy in all it's too much. The body that rides best your body, whose mouth saddles the naked salt of your far gone hips, whose tongue translates the rock language of all your elegant scars. Go with the one who cries out for his tragic sisters as he chops the winter's wood. The one whose skin triggers your heart into a heaven of blood waltzes. Go with the one who resembles most your father, and not the father that you can point out on a map. But the father who is here is your home, is the key to your front door. Know that your first love will only be the first, and the second and third and even the fourth will unprepare you for the most important, the blessed, the beast, the last love, which is the most terrifying kind. Because which of us wants to go with what can murder us, can reveal to us our true heart's end in its last 30 years spent in poverty, can mimic the sound of our bird-throated mothers, replicate the warmth of our brother's tempers, can pull us out of ourselves until we are no longer sisters or daughters or sword swallowers, but instead women who give and lead and take and want and want and want. Because there is no shame in wanting. And you will hear yourself say, Last love, I wish to die, so I may come back to you new and never tasted by any other mouth but yours. And I want to be the hands that pull your children out of you and tuck them deep inside myself until they are ready to be the children of such a royal and staggering love. Or you will say, 
last love. I am old, and I have spent myself on the courage list have wasted too many clocks on less deserving, so I hurl myself at the throne of you and lie humbly at your feet. Last love, let me never roll out of this heavy dream of you. Let the day I was born mean my life will end where you end. Let the man behind the church do what he did if it brings me to you. Let the girls in the locker room corner me again if it brings me to you. Let the wrong beds find me if it brings me to you. Let this wild depression throw me beneath its hooves if it brings me to you. Let my father break me again and again if it brings me to you. Last love, I let other men borrow your children. Forgive me. Last love, I vowed my heart to another. Forgive me. Last love, I have cursed the women you loved before me. Forgive me. Last love, I envy your mother's body where you resided first. Forgive me. Last love, I am all that is left. Forgive me. Last love, every day without you was a life I crawled out of. Amen. Last love, you are my last love. Amen. Last love, I am all that is left. Amen. I am all that is left. Amen. Thanks, guys.